Hello, you guys. Welcome back. I appreciate you being here. I hope you already know that my name is Madeleine Klein and I talk about all things Canadian true crime, missing persons, mystery, and history. Today, I want to talk about one of Canada's first known serial killers, Clifford Olson, also known as the Beast of BC, who terrorized British Columbia for 19 months between 1980 and 1981. All of his known victims were between the ages of 9 and 18. He would drug them, force them to drink, sexually assault, and torture his victims before ultimately killing them. So a little bit about Cliff. He was born January 1st, 1940 in Vancouver, BC, and grew up around Richmond, and he was the oldest of four siblings. He was always a troubled kid, being sexually abused by an uncle at a very young age, and always being targeted by bullies. He learned how to box for the sole purpose of getting back at the people who beat him up. He started skipping school at 10 years old and dropped out altogether by the eighth grade. At 17, he would find himself in prison for the first time, but certainly not the last. His track record was littered with absolutely anything you could think of, being arrested 94 times for things like possession of stolen goods and firearms, forgery, fraud, armed robbery, and his crimes would only escalate to gross indecency, rape, and murder. Clifford would end up escaping prison seven separate times. In 1965, he was serving a three and a half year sentence for breaking and entering. He faked an illness and three guards took him to the Shaughnessy Hospital where he successfully got away. He would be at large for one week and be found by a police dog in Blaine, Washington. Somehow in his journey, he obtained a gun and pulled it on two teens. Four different police forces were involved in the hunt for him. During the 1970s, Clifford would be released from prison five times on mandatory supervision, but always ended up back in jail because he just didn't know how to behave. Why would you keep letting him out? In January of 1980, Clifford was once again released from prison and immediately started back up on his bullshit. A couple months after his January release, he would meet a woman named Joan Hale and start a relationship with her. To the surprise of no one, he was very abusive toward her and lived mainly off of her divorce settlement. He would end up going back to jail one more time that year, being released on September 7th, 1980, and this is where his crimes took a heinous turn. On November 17th, 1980, Clifford would abduct and murder his first known victim, 12-year-old Christine Weller. Police didn't consider her disappearance suspicious as she had run away before. Her body was found on Christmas Day that same year. She was strangled and had multiple stab wounds. It's said that after the abduction and murder of 12-year-old Christine Weller, Clifford could not shut up about the case, offering theories and such. Fast forward to April 16th, 1981. Clifford abducted and murdered 13-year-old Colleen Dagnall in Surrey, BC, and her body wouldn't be found for five months. Less than a week later, on April 22nd, 15-year-old Darren Johnsrud was abducted from a local mall in Coquitlam. He was just visiting his mom over Easter break. I found out he's actually from my city, Regina, Saskatchewan. It would take less than two weeks to discover the beaten teen's lifeless body. It was also in April of 1981 that Clifford and Joan would have a son and they would marry the next month on May 15th, 1981. He molested a seven-year-old girl on their wedding day and just four days after their wedding, he would murder another teen. On May 19th, Clifford picked up 16-year-old Sandra Wolfsteiner, who was hitchhiking to her boyfriend's house. Clifford murdered Sandra in the woods, not far from where he picked her up. One month later, 13-year-old Ada Court disappeared on the way to her friend's house, and her body wouldn't be found until two months later. July 2nd, nine-year-old Simon Partington disappeared while riding his bike to his friend's house. This is the first child disappearance police would admit suspicion and foul play. All others were considered runaways. Days later, Clifford approached two teenage girls and offered them a job cleaning windows. He arranged to meet back up with them on July 6th, and he did just that. He picked the girls up, but then told them he only had enough work for one of them. He took one of the girls, gave her alcohol, and attempted to sexually assault her in the backseat of his car. Thankfully, this young woman managed to get away and flagged down a police officer and told him that this guy just tried to rape her. A call is put out and Clifford is arrested and interrogated, but he was such a master manipulator and narcissist, 
he convinced the cops that she was into it. The cops also discredited the victim as she had been drinking. She was 16. During this interrogation, he actually convinced police he was an ally to them. He reminded them that back in 1976, while he was incarcerated in the Prince Albert Penitentiary, he was stabbed seven times for squealing on the drug couriers in the prison. So they were like, oh, he's on our side. Well, okay, you're free to go. And he left without even being put on the radar or slightly connected to the string of disappearances and murders in the area. He was let off scot-free and two days later on July 9th, Clifford abducted 14-year-old Judy Cosma. He gave her a ton of drugs and alcohol, raped her and murdered her. The next day, Clifford went on a two week vacation with his family. Judy's body was found less than a week later on July 25th in very close proximity to where Darren's body had been found. This would finally make police realize they might be dealing with a serial killer at this point. Duh. Immediately upon getting home from his vacation, Clifford would strike again. On July 23rd, Clifford found 15-year-old Raymond King at an employment center and lured him in with the promise of work. Clifford beat Raymond to death, including driving a spike into the top of his head and dumping his body on a campground. More specifically, he dumped the body off of a cliff beside a trail. He then pushed boulders and large rocks down onto the already lifeless teen's body, crushing Raymond's chest and head. Later that very same night, police showed up at Clifford's house and asked him if he wanted to be an informant for them for money. But I guess this was just to gain his trust. Clifford told them he had information on these current abductions and murders and that he would try and help them, but it would cost them. Police were sure they had their guy, but didn't start to surveil him due to lack of evidence. Is his three kilometer long record of assholery not evidence enough? Unfortunately, two days later, he would abduct and murder 18-year-old Sigrun Arnd, a student visiting from Germany for the summer. Clifford drugged, raped, and murdered her with a hammer before disposing of her body in a nearby ditch with shallow water. He also covered her body with twigs and leaves. July 27th, just two days after that, Clifford drugged, raped, and murdered 15-year-old Terry Lynn Carson. He stabbed her in the head with a screwdriver, breaking the tool off inside of her, but this didn't kill her. He dragged Terry to a ditch nearby with shallow water, placed her face down, and stood on her until she drowned. He dumped her body in the woods near Fraser River. July 27th was actually the day police were to begin surveillance on Clifford, but he was up and gone too early before police set up. By the time Clifford got home that night, police had their surveillance set up, but get this. When Terry Lynn didn't come home and her mother tried to report her missing, police brushed it off as a runaway. I'm just so confused. They know they have a child serial killer on their hands, surveillance on a suspect, but still have the audacity to consider Terry Lynn a runaway. A cab. Oh, they also surveilled him for five hours and called it a day. Police regrouped and ended up meeting up with Clifford on July 28th in a parking lot. Clifford told police he wanted $3,000 a month to be a confidential informant, but police knew what he was all about and told him that they were ready to pay out $100,000 for any information on the recent child slayings. Clifford's ears perked right up. He asked the cop to pick a number between one and 10, and the cop said nine. Clifford told them that he would give them a letter with nine numbers, each corresponding to a location. He told the cops, quote, what you find there will be your business. Clifford wouldn't elaborate any further and told them that he would be considered a snitch and he had a family to protect. The cop and Clifford arranged to meet up again in two days. The next day on July 29th, Olson and two others attempted to pick up two teenage girls and give them alcohol. Cops thankfully acted quickly on that one and arrested and detained Clifford, only to release him at 3.30 a.m. on July 30th, once again without charge. Later that day on July 30th, Clifford would pick up 17-year-old Louise Chartrand near Whistler, BC. He took the teen to a gravel pit 
tied her up, drugged her, and raped her for hours. He hit her in the head with a hammer, and while she was barely breathing, buried her under gravel and large rocks and was left to die. After this murder, he got home around 6.30 a.m. and told his wife the cops were trying to frame him. They were packing up and moving to Alberta. And they made it. Him, his wife, and their son successfully made it to Calgary. By August 5th, Clifford was back in Coquitlam for some reason, but the cops were following him and saw him commit other crimes like burglary. It was on August 12, 1981, Clifford Olson was arrested trying to pick up two hitchhikers on Vancouver Island. He had taken a ferry earlier that day and burglarized two houses before trying to pick the teens up. Clifford was originally like, I didn't do anything. But when they searched him and found his notebook, inside he had written the name Judy Cosma. This was enough to finally directly link him to one of the murders. He was taken to Burnaby where he was held for the burglaries and trying to pick up the teens. And it was when he was detained, his entire story started to unravel. On August 18th, Clifford Olson was officially charged for the murder of 14 year old Judy Cosma. This case is one of the most heinous I've ever come across. This is like a crossover episode of my Tuesday Canadian true crime and cases that keep me up. Clifford Olson may be one of the absolute worst people to ever live. What he did to his victims was unimaginable. And he somehow continued to terrorize these families even after being apprehended. Clifford Olson struck up a cash for bodies deal with police, telling them he wanted a hundred grand for the locations of the bodies of his victims. 10 grand per body, the first body being a freebie. And this offer was accepted. Clifford gleefully told police where all of the bodies were and even grinned while they were being recovered. It's alleged he exclaimed to his wife on the phone, honey, you're gonna be rich. Joan Hale denies any knowledge of any wrongdoing of Clifford and considers herself a victim. I don't have enough information on her to make any claims as to whether that's true or not. Who knows? The trial started January 11th, 1982, but would only last three days. He originally pleaded not guilty and then changed his mind and pleaded guilty to all 11 murders. Clifford Olson was charged with 11 counts of first degree murder and sentenced to 11 consecutive life sentences with no chance of parole for 25 years. Side note, I said this last week, death penalty for people like this. There is no doubt he did it. He was not remorseful, even in the least, and there's no chance of him getting out anyway. Just get rid of him. Clifford Olson was a psychopathic narcissist. I can't even put into words how evil this man was. He actually scored a 38 out of 40 on the psychopath test. That is insanely high. In May of 1986, Clifford sent a letter to the parents of Darren Johnsrud detailing their son's graphic murder. In December of 1989, he claimed that he asked God for forgiveness and God forgave him, so it's all good. In March of 1997, there was a faint hope clause that he invoked, allowing prisoners to apply for parole after serving 15 years. This was denied in 17 minutes. And actually because of Clifford Olson, this clause was abolished for murderers. In July of 2006, after spending 25 years behind bars, he would apply for parole again, but it would be denied in 30 minutes. So that's good, I guess. This is bizarre. It was at this parole hearing, Clifford told them that he had struck up a deal with the US general attorney for information on 9-11 and he'll be extradited. What an absolute idiot, oh my God. He would apply for and be denied parole one more time in November of 2010. This was after the public found out that he had been receiving $1,000 a month in pension since he was 65. Outrage ensued. Thankfully, and finally on September 30th, 2011, Clifford Olson died of terminal cancer at the age of 71. Woohoo! I hope he got no medical treatment. I just really want to paint a picture on how truly despicable this piece of trash was. Parents of missing and murdered children would write to him asking if he had any information on what had happened to their child. And he would string them along, telling them that, yeah, 
maybe I do know something. This would only lead to Clifford asking these parents for bizarre things like a photo of them having sexual relations with a dog and other sick things. He would end up writing to these families something to the effect of ha 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 fooled you. He was just so grotesque and callous I can't find the words to describe my disgust for him. I think that's more than enough for today. If you've made it this far, good work, cause this one was heavy. As always, I am gonna have a couple links down below. I'm gonna link both episodes that Dark Poutine did on Clifford Olsen. It's two parts and incredibly informative. It's where I got the majority of my information. And I'll also have my link tree linked down below if you wanna check out any of my other content. Like, subscribe, comment, let me know who you wanna hear about, do whatever you want, just don't kidnap or kill anyone. I appreciate you guys as per always. Thank you for joining me in my creepy little corner and I will see you guys next week. Bye.